Hey guys, Floyd here. Uh, I want to provide an update on a new piece of equipment that we have. And it's really not a new piece of equipment, but it's a new component for a piece of equipment that we use. Um, and it has to do with our O2 disposable CPAP system. Now, like our, like traditionally we had, um, the components are still our mask, our regulator, uh, and the oxygen tubing, okay? So you'll also notice that, or you probably already noticed that before, we had this white cap that goes on this port here. And a lot of people may not have known what this port was for or why that was even there. And, well, that's there so that you can attach a manometer, okay? Now, a manometer is almost just like a pressure gauge. Um, before we had this manometer, what you had to do was go by that chart that we put in the ambulances that say if we want to give five centimeters of water uh, pressure to this patient, then we would need to put it at eight liters a minute. Or if we needed to go to 20, we would need to put it at X liters per minute. Um, and it's not very precise or accurate. And when we use this device, we really want precision and we want to know what they're getting. Okay, so all you have to do take this manometer and put it on the port like so. You've got this rubber piece right here that you just kind of push on, maybe twist a little bit, no, nope. just push it on. Make sure it's seated firmly because we don't want it blowing off when we actually hook it, hook it up to oxygen. And then you just put it on the patient and you can see that it's kind of spring loaded right here. You can see the springs a little bit and you can see this red line. Now that red line is what you use to guide your pressure. So if that red line's on five, then the patient's getting five centimeters of water pressure. So we put it on the patient and we would turn our oxygen on. Now, if you look, if I just turn the oxygen up, this does not move. So we can't really determine how much pressure the patient's getting. Um, so what you have to do, you can put it against a hard surface right here. And you want to do this before you put it on the patient because we don't want them to suffocate if something happens and our tubing's not hooked up and we're not ready to turn the oxygen on. So you look, if I've got it on a hard surface and I want to get it to where you can see the numbers. The first line right here in the green is 5, the second is 10, so watch. I'm just slowly turning on my oxygen and I'm waiting for that red line to come up. Now we're about five. Now we're going up. Now we're at ten. Okay? It's very simple and straightforward, which we like. Um, a few pearls that I want to go over real quick is How do you know how much pressure to give the patient? Well, a good rule of thumb is if they have a reactive airway disease, if they have COPD or asthma, then start off a little lower. Start off about five, okay? Because their lungs are probably um, kind of hyperinflated, right? They have a trouble getting air out. So we want as little pressure as possible to make it easier uh, for them to exhale. Um, if you, if you need to, you can always titrate up from there. Like if you put them on five and it's not enough and they need more air, you can go up. Um, now if they have pulmonary edema or ARDS or any kind of fluid in their lungs, pneumonia, something like that, you can start off about 10, okay? They need higher PEEP, which is all CPAP is, is continuous PEEP. Um, they need higher PEEP, so start off about 10. Don't go over 20, okay? Because over 20, the esophageal sphincter can open and all the air can go in the stomach. Now, hopefully you remember the contraindications for this device, okay? Anyone who can't maintain their own airway, so anyone who's unresponsive, um, anyone with a pneumothorax, right? Because that would obviously make it worse. Um, and then anyone who the device won't fit on, like if they've got severe facial fractures, or something like that. It, it won't maintain a seal. 
anytime you use this device, measure entitled CO2. Measure entitled CO2 does a number of things for us. It lets us know, one, that the patient is breathing, that air is moving in and out, because we, if we have CO2, then air is... Uh, got to be they have to be exhaling therefore theoretically the patient should be able to inhale if they're exhaling right so we know that their airway is patent with this device it would also clue us in to early problems okay if you start seeing the entitled decrease or the respiratory rate decrease um, then we could know that they're hyper or hypoventilating um, so there's also a few other things that you can look for on your e-title. And if you can see on the board here, I kind of drew them all out right here. Now, if you look right here, that's a normal entitled CO2 waveform. The waveform is square, okay, and it's upright, which is normal. If you look over here, um, if you look over here, you can see that the waveform goes up squares off and then it drops back down to baseline but you can see each consecutive one gets higher and higher and higher it never goes back down to baseline like it should that's a patient who's air trapping um, they're not able to fully exhale they can't get the air out so they take another breath before they fully exhale so that's bad that's air trapping that's a patient who you would want to consider lowering the pressure in your CPAP or taking it off completely or being a little more aggressive with your therapies like albuterol and atrovent, solumedrol, or maybe even consider IV magnesium for these people. The last waveform I want to talk about is what you would expect to see, the morphology and the shape of the waveform on a patient with severe bronchospasm. You can see right here that instead of a sharp increase and in it being straight up it kind of looks like a shark fin right so it kind of curves into uh, the top of the waveform it's not square and upright that's what we call a loss of the alveolar plateau that's because the patient's alveoli are not emptying evenly so that's a sign of severe bronchospasm and we would want to treat that patient aggressively um, so, and when you're measuring entitled CO2, the last thing before I stop, there's two ways you can measure it. You can put the mainstream device in between the mask and the regulator, or you can put this right over a nasal cannula. I recommend putting this right over the nasal cannula. The reason being is that if you put the mainstream device right here, in between the mask and the regulator, then all the air that's continuously flowing out of here will actually wash your CO2 out and you'll get a bad reading. If the nasal cannula is right here, then there's less washout, so you'll have a better reading. So put the nasal cannula on, put this over the nasal cannula, um, and it actually will not um, affect the seal. It may a little bit, but the amount that it's going to, uh, the amount of oxygen that's going to leak is negligible, and you're still going to get the pressures you need. <clears throat> if you have any questions, text me or call me, and um, yeah, I have a low threshold to use this. It's a wonderful device, but if you got it on the patient, you see any problems, also have a low threshold to take it off. If the patient's not doing well on it, don't sit there and mess around. Okay. If they're on this device and they're crashing, the first thing you want to do is take them off the device, bag them with a BBM because a number of things that could be happening and this could make things worse. So again, have a low threshold to use it. If a patient's not oxygenating on a non-rebreather, let's say you've got them on a 15 liter non-rebreather and they're still 85% and they're in a lot of stress, put this thing on. But remember your contraindications and if the patient starts to crash, if their SATs start dropping, the blood pressure starts dropping, or they have a change of mental status, take this thing off and use a BBM. And let me know if you've got any questions. Thank you.